Hi, and welcome to Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm your host, Dr. Tom Kennedy. Now today, what we're going to talk about is fermentation. All right, now, fermentation, this is a way that life can extract some energy from the foods it eats, right? So you don't always have oxygen around. So what you do is you ferment your, your molecules. You can ferment things like glucose, and that produces at least a little bit of ATP. So of course, you're not going through the oxidative phosphorylation. Now, when it comes to life, there are multiple routes of fermentation. There's lots of ways that, that, that life does this. However, there's two major ones. The first one, of course, is lactic acid fermentation done by animals. And another one is alcohol fermentation done by yeast. It would be interesting if animals did alcohol fermentation. You would exercise and produce alcohol. Hmm. So here's the point of it. Glycolysis. This is an ancient metabolic pathway, right? And glycolysis is shared by all living cells. And it's a way that you can get at least two ATPs from a molecule of glucose. That's not bad, right? I mean, that's a little bit. It's better than nothing. Well, for glycolysis to proceed, it's a redox reaction, right? And you start to oxidize glucose molecules. And uh, eventually you, you form two pyruvates. But if you're going to oxidize glucose, and you know where this is going, redox reaction, you need something to be reduced. And our electron carriers, of course, for that is NAD+. Plus. So NAD plus is going to get reduced to NADH as glucose is going to get oxidized. Now, if we're doing glycolysis, and this is happening without oxygen, what that means is the NADHs get reduced and they're going to add up because you don't have oxygen. You're not going to oxidize them on the electron transport chain. You start to see a problem here, right? You're going to start running out of oxidized NAD pluses to oxidize glucose. So there's fermentation. And basically, whether you're doing alcohol or lactic acid fermentation, what you're going to do is oxidize NADH back to NAD. And whether you're doing lactic acid or alcohol fermentation depends on the type of organism. So as I mentioned earlier, of course, animals, we do lactic acid fermentation, right? So you've ever sprinted, run up a flight of stairs. Me, I power lifted. Yeah, that was me back in the day, power lifting. Powerlifting, bodybuilding, weightlifting in general, sprinting, any strenuous type of exercise, what happens is your body is going to quickly run out of ATP. But you're going to run out of it so quickly that cellular respiration, you know, oxidative phosphorylation can't keep up, right? So basically, you just rely on glycolysis. And as a result of relying on glycolysis, you don't make as much ATP. You know, that's why when you're bench pressing, you know, you got some weight on the bar and you're going one, two, three, and you get like five or six, seven or eight, depending on how heavy you're going. And you're like, spot, spot. Okay. What's happened there is you've basically exhausted your store of ATP and your muscles have a higher energy demand than oxidative phosphorylation can, can do, right? So you make a little bit of ATP using lactic acid fermentation. So you're doing it through glycolysis, okay? So let's take a look at the nuts and bolts. How does lactic acid fermentation exactly work at the molecular level? Okay, at the molecular level, here's our, here's our reaction here. You've got, um, you've got pyruvate, right? And pyruvate will become reduced to lactate. Now, if we're reducing something, we're going to add electrons to it and even add a hydrogen to it. So if NADH has been reduced during glycolysis, okay, then we can oxidize NADH back to NAD+. It's going to give pyruvate the electrons and the hydrogens, and as it reduces pyruvate, we form lactic acid. Okay, so that's, that's how lactic acid works, and that provides an oxidized form of our electron carrier to keep glycolysis going, okay? Now, of course, like I said, um, you can't keep going very long if you're doing strenuous exercise because you will run out of ATP and you start breathing heavy. And this brings me to my next point. I mean, this is not so much of a cellular molecular biology problem as it is an evolutionary problem. And I always like to remind people that there are no perfectly adapted organisms, right? There's always a trade-off. 
yeah, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger from the movie Conan the Barbarian, early 80s movie. Oh, I love this film. It is not family friendly, by the way. Don't watch it with your kids. I always wanted to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he's swinging that broadsword, right? But Arnold Schwarzenegger was a very, um, as you well know, he's a very successful bodybuilder. He has very large muscles. He can lift a lot of weight. So he's got a, what is called type 2B glycolytic muscle fiber. Hmm, glycolytic, right? It's telling you splitting glucose. And that's where you know a lot of the energy for these large muscles come from. They can lift a lot of weights. They fatigue easily. And they also have lower mitochondrial densities compared to somebody like Lance Armstrong. Now, I know Lance has been a little discredited here recently for some doping. Oh my. Um, he's still an incredible athlete. He is still in rarefied air. All of those endurance bikers are. The difference here is I could out bench press Lance Armstrong any day of the week. It wouldn't even be a competition. Now, put me on a bike and ask me to climb up the hill in the Sandias? There's no way. I'd be sucking wind. I couldn't do it. And he has what is called type 1 oxidative muscle fibers. Oxidative, right? So his muscle fibers might be smaller, but they're packed full of mitochondria. And they can generate a force over and over and over and over and over and over again. He just can't generate a lot of force compared to like somebody with lots of muscle. Okay. So lactic acid is not used just by animals. It's also used by other microorganisms, including bacteria. And of course, yogurt is made from lactic acid fermentation. And so are some beers, which is interesting because if you've ever heard of a lambic beer, then um, oh, if you're under 21, you're just drinking warm milk. But the rest of the civilized world, you can drink at the age of 18. And uh, some of these beers, like I said, use lactic acid fermentation. Now, on the subject of alcohol. All right. Some of you are under 21. You don't drink alcohol. The rest, some other people do drink alcohol. It's a major industry. Brewing is huge in this country. And uh, anybody that's interested in brewing, that is actually going into craft beer, craft alcohol. Um, they're actually making spirits like aging whiskey in like days. This is big business. And it's a field you might want to consider going into. Okay, ethanol fermentation. So you're, you're brewing beer, you're brewing wine, you're brewing mead. And what happens is if you've ever brewed an alcoholic beverage, you know you can't let air get in there. Air has oxygen, right? So what these yeast do is they take pyruvate, all right? Now remember, pyruvate's got a carboxyl group. Look at the top of that molecule. You see a carboxyl group up there. What's going to happen is it's going to pop that carboxyl group off and form carbon dioxide. And that's the bubbles in your beer. That's where it comes from. And if you're doing wine, you let that carbon dioxide escape. If you are making champagne or fizzy uh, wine, you don't let the bubbles escape. Okay, then you take the acetaldehyde. Notice there's a carbonyl group there. That carbonyl group will get reduced to a hydroxyl group by adding the electrons and hydrogens to it. And you're reducing it by oxidizing NADH back to NAD+. And that way, the ethanol can continue on with glycolysis. Meanwhile, it produces the byproduct ethanol. And that's where ethanol comes from. And of course, ethanol dissolves in water. That is a byproduct of yeast. Now, um, Freeman's book calls it like yeast urine. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not yeast urine. For one, urine is an actual byproduct of metabolism of, of animals. Specifically, a lot of it is a way to get rid of nitrogenous waste. So urine, urea, uric acid, urea, all of these things have nitrogenous waste in them, which, um, which is different from just having this. I know I'm splitting hairs, but whatever. Okay, now, um, there's some interesting things about ethanol. Of course, animals can't do that because if you were exercising strenuously, you would build up ethanol in your muscles. That wouldn't be good. You'd, you'd work out and get intoxicated. But, um, yeah, look at that. Did beer give us civilization? Wow, um, I know this is totally not in the book guys for my my normal class here but uh this to me is actually something really fun to think about you know there before i get going with this beer on civilization beer is the number or alcohol is the number one worst drug in the world due to 
uh, lack of productivity problems worldwide. Now, not to say it's uh, it's more harmful than heroin or cocaine. Yeah, those drugs are way, way, way worse. But many fewer people are on them. But worldwide, alcohol is a problem. So always drink responsibly. And um, only if you're over 21 in this country. Now, did beer give us civilization? The answer is possibly. Okay, so let me set up a scenario. 11,500 years ago, the end of the last ice age is coming, right? It was actually ended. Now, humans have been on this planet for between 200 and 300,000 years, depending on which type of evidence you look at. And for the first, let's just say 200,000 years of our existence, we were hunter-gatherers, right? We were hunting game, gathering nuts and berries. We rarely settled down and there was no agriculture. Then at the end of the last ice age, what happens is the, the climate stabilized. That's important, right? And people began to grow crops and settle down and abandon their hunter-gatherer lifestyles. That's weird. Why would you settle down? Well, most people say that you would grow crops for food. Not so fast. Um, it turns out that there is some really good evidence that the first crops were made to brew beer or wine or mead. No, oh, that's weird, isn't it? Why would you do that? Well, there are actually several lines of evidence. Uh, the reason why the agricultural revolution may have been sparked by brewing beer. Some of the earliest pots we see and some of the earliest crops we see were clearly could have been used to brew alcoholic beverages. The other reason why you would brew an alcoholic beverage, this is kind of interesting, is that the alcohol can kill waterborne diseases. And throughout the history of civilization, diarrhea has killed more people than anything else. I, that's crazy, isn't it? I mean, more than any other single disease with the exception of malaria. But diarrhea actually kills more people than malaria. It's just that diarrhea is caused by a lot of different things. So a little bit of alcohol would have, made it, would have made it safe to drink and you would have gotten some carbs from there. And the third one, social lubrication. Your small bands of people wandering around hunting and gathering. You see another small band, you might not want to interact with them. You might be fearful of them. You don't know them. However, beer provided social lubrication. It allowed to kind of brought down these barriers and it allowed people to come together and talk. Um, up until the COVID virus, how many of you have met your new best friend over a couple beers, right? So we think that the social lubrication may have actually been an aspect of it. But in reality, the drinking of um, beer for being a little bit safer than water as civilization evolved is, is not far from the truth. And in fact, when we look around at other ancient civilizations, almost all of them brewed beer, especially in the West. And in fact, the ancient Egyptians, they used to give their workers and their slaves like a gallon of beer a day as payment. A gallon. Man, that's a lot. Now, just to say these, these ancient beers were nothing like the hopped up beers we have today that have six, seven, eight percent alcohol. I, I don't even know if you can call that beer. It's beer like substance. I'm not saying it doesn't taste good. Just beer should be like three percent. It should be, you know, that's the ancient beer. I'm a purist. But I do like the other things they are passing off as beer. They should call them beer-like substances. Okay. Well, I hope you learned something about beer and civilization. I actually put a link. There's a link in the New York Times. That theory has been posted, has been circulating since the 1950s. I promise you I didn't pull that out of thin air. Okay. This has been another episode of Tom Kennedy Science.